The third key or the third theme that you find in any spiritual awakening or revival is the, the key or the truth of repentance. Repentance from our sins. It's, it's actually the centerpiece of it. You, you kind of know your inner revival when people are repenting. Because naturally, human beings don't like to do that. And this is the aspect of the, the willingness to confess and to forsake your sins. It's both of those. And actually, that comes right out of a definition of repentance, really. We find in Proverbs 28, verse 13, that people who conceal their sins will not prosper. You hide them, you conceal them, you won't prosper. But if you confess them and you turn from them, one translation says, if you confess and forsake, then you will receive mercy. That is a great definition, actually, of what repentance is. Repentance is acknowledging wrong, confessing it to God and to others if necessary, and then turning away from it, asking God for the power to not go back to it, to, to give it up, turn from it. Matthew 3, 7 to 10 is a great scripture about John the Baptist and his repentance ministry. I mean, he was really a revivalist, and he kind of lit a mini revival of repentance that paved the way for Jesus to come. I've chosen to take this translation out of a modern translation called the message. And I, I love this, the wording of this. This is Matthew 3, 7 to 10. When John realized that a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees were showing up for the baptismal experience because it was becoming the popular thing to do, he exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to make any difference? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a descendant of Abraham is neither here nor there. Descendants of Abraham are a dime a dozen. What counts is your life. Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead wood, it goes into the fire. You like that? I love that translation where he just tells it like it is about, in this case, people who are religious hypocrites kind of wanted to get in on the, on, the, on the going thing. And John looked right in their hearts and said, you have a need for repentance, which is change. Here's Acts 2, verse 38, where, again, I have this in a modern translation where I like the way it translates the word repentance. Because that's kind of an old word. A lot of people don't understand it today, but here's what it means. This is the first sermon that was ever preached after Jesus rose and you know, rose from the dead, went into heaven, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Here's the first sermon. Peter's words are, the, the, the climax of it, <clears throat> change your hearts and lives. What is that? That's repentance. That's the definition of it. It's not just a few tears and this and that. It's heart change and life change. That's really what it is. So change your hearts and lives and be baptized, identify with Christ. And each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I've been in many spiritual awakenings, small and large. In fact, I even met my wife in one. And it was through her repentance our relationship began. I've been in many settings where people confess their sins and, and things begin to happen. But I also had the privilege of being in kind of a, a national one. And it was a big one. It, it, it was called Washington for Jesus. And it took place on April 29th, 1980. And I had the privilege of actually serving in that event. Actually, I spent an entire year of my life helping to ready, along with a team of about 12, uh, a, a city for a massive prayer meeting that was oriented toward repentance. And on that day, on April 29th, 1980, 700,000 people came to Washington, D.C. We actually bought out the subway system. They were all in the center of the mall. We had a huge stage that was there. They went in all directions toward the Capitol building and toward the, the Lincoln Memorial. And, and I'll never forget so many times, it actually was a 12 hour day of repentance. It went from six in the morning till six at night. 
fasting and praying. And all throughout the day, these 700,000 people were repenting for the sins of America, confessing, asking God's forgiveness, you know, praying, worshiping, doing a lot of things, but repentance was at the heart of it. And as a result of, of that event, what was amazing is that we, we didn't see a full-blown revival in America, but we saw kind of a, at least a, a changing of the, of the tenor. Because six months after that event, Ronald Reagan was swept into office. And everybody was actually shocked, utterly shocked. I, I remember living in Washington, D.C. during that time and looking at the newspaper, and it was, they, they were stunned utterly stunned that where certain people that wanted the nation to go, it was now going to go back in kind of a godly direction through you know, Reagan believing in certain kinds of things. And I believe it was directly related to the prayers and repentance of the people. In fact, I, I honestly believe that during that time period, the, the inertia of evil in America was at least slowed down to a degree. It's now caught up with us again in this time period. But God used this tremendous gathering and a number of others that have taken place too. Promise Keepers brought a million there to repent a number of years later. There have been other events taking place. And uh, God used this even to look down upon a nation and say, okay, I see you changing and I'm going to help bring change. I'm even going to help on a political level. Because again, uh, that when the hearts of God's people move, God does things that affect the land. Even the, the healing is talked about in 2 Chronicles 7.14. So that was a wonderful example to me of how even a nation can confess its sins to God and God begin to bring good through it. Let's move on to principle number four, which is the, the, the principle or the key, the theme of unity. Unity. You always find that being stressed in a time of revival. The importance of people uniting together. 